Hi, my name is Tim Brailsford. I'm the Vice Chancellor at Bond University, which is a university on the Gold Coast in sunny Queensland. And I'm Rachel Cooper. Thanks so much for coming in today. How technology is impacting the way in which you are educating, I think is a start, and how important it is um, as students transition through from primary school through to tertiary and then obviously on to corporate. So, so I think the technology itself is a challenge for every industry. It doesn't matter which industry you're working in, you're investing in, um, or you have an interest in. Mm -hmm. Technology is pervasive and it is constant in terms of its change and its impact. So in higher education, which is my speciality, in higher education, I'm, I've been very fortunate to have worked at some great universities mm -hmm. um, and I've had the pleasure and, uh, and benefit from a great personal education myself as well. I've been in the system now for over three decades and I often get asked about the changes and, and the biggest change is technology. Mm. So when I first started off and my, my first ever teaching job, um, we were lucky to have to have moved from a blackboard to an overhead projector. Mm -hmm. And that overhead projector required you to write out the slides because there was no technology to actually essentially print the slides. So you had to write on the slides and you, you went into this classroom. Uh, well, actually, it was a, typically a large lecture theatre. And your greatest technology risk was the bulb on the overhead projector had blown. Yes. And, um, the lecturer uh, or your colleague who had been in beforehand had blown on him or her, and then they just decided to not tell anyone. So, <laughs> um, And when, when I did my, my doctorate, I had to learn computer programming to actually write the code in order to execute the algorithms. Yes. So uh, I was a Fortran programmer, Mm -hmm. originally and when you talk to students nowadays about Fortran <laughs> they, they, they look at you as if you're talking yeah. about something from Venus or Mars sure. in that regard. Um, so th that's just a personal reflection on just how much it has changed and when we look at now the computing power which is in someone the palm of someone's hand mm. through their mobile device is just extraordinary. But having said that yeah, the, the challenge I still think for educators is how to actually grab someone's attention to get them interested in the topic and indeed hopefully to get them passionate in the topic. Yes. And get their mind switched on and try and remove all the outside influences and try and get their attention and make them really interested in achieving and achieving through learning. And, and I think that hasn't changed certainly over the last three decades and probably hasn't changed in several thousand years mm. in, in that regard. But the, the, the technology which is now around universities is, uh, is, is quite amazing and I wouldn't profess to, to be on top of it all. Um, I'm in a fortunate position where um, I have people around me that know far more than I do in this regard. But we, we now have access to uh, information sources from around the world. Mm -hmm. so, we have students that can log on hypothetically in, um, in Israel, London, Warsaw, Vladivostok, and they can access materials from our academics written on the Gold Coast. And similarly, our students can, through our connections, relationships, and, and obviously the internet, access materials and IP from yeah, New York, Toronto, Sao Paulo, etc. Fantastic, isn't it? So, so the challenge for, for educators is, is no longer really about um, being the font of all knowledge. Because w when you think about a child at a primary school and there is a teacher in front of them, mm -hmm. that teacher in that child's, that child's eyes 
sort of knows everything. And, and when you go into high school, you used to have the view that when you went into geography, for instance, that you know, the expert on geography was the teacher on ge geography. Yeah. And, and then when you went to university, it became more specialist. And so if you were then going to enrol in a, a business course or a finance course and you did a subject on derivatives, you know, it was that professor over there who wrote the textbook on derivatives and they possessed all the knowledge. Well, nowadays, no one possesses all that knowledge. That knowledge is shared knowledge. So the, the challenge for all educators, I think, is how best to disseminate that knowledge. Of course. And for, I think, the, the, the current and future generations, they probably don't know what they don't know. And I don't mean that to sound in any way condescending, but because they've been brought up with all of this technology, you know, they, they just assume that the technology will do it for them. So I come back to my earlier comment that grabbing someone's attention, bringing some interest into the topic, into the subject, and, and making someone passionate about it is I really think the key to successful, a successful education and a successful educator. Okay, now I remember like we were talking about overhead projectors and like going to the library and getting out you know, 15 books that were piled up on my desk and reading through them. And at the, you know, you've moved, we've moved from that to obviously being able to source from the internet and you've talked about being able to source information from all over the globe. How challenging is that for students in terms of there is such a raft of information, it's not that they're struggling to find it. How do you go about teaching them how to disseminate what's important and what's not? So, so most universities, my university included, as part of our orientation and certainly during their first semester, all students get exposed to a unit and a series of uh, series of topics which are surrounded by or well, encapsulated by a theme of research skills. Mm -hmm. So this is not really how to um, do the core academic research. So this is not preparation for a doctoral thesis or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's really around effective use of time to find uh, the relevant pieces of information on the internet mm -hmm. and to have the discipline to say, well, I'm not sure that this is really going to be relevant uh, and to also have uh, sufficient expertise with a lot of the search engines now. Yes. Because some of those research engines, just given the, um, uh, the, the marketing and advertising algorithms that sit behind them, you, you almost have to play a bit of a trick on them sometimes to get through the um, to sort of get through the wall of the marketing and the websites which the search engine and its algorithms want you to read. Of course. Um, so students often don't understand that. So when they get, when they come to university, I mean they, they're used to they all they all talk about you know their favourite browser and so on. <laughs> and when you sit down and talk to them, well, why is that your favourite browser? You know, and often they will talk about sort of speeds or something, and then we go well. That's not necessarily your browser. Yes. Right? You know? um, so getting students to understand that the, the information which is given to them is not necessarily the best information. And in some cases in this uh, world of supposed fake news, yeah, of getting them to understand that what they actually are presented with over the net is not necessarily the right information either. Uh, so that, that look, that is, that is a challenge, and it's really by trial and error, and getting students to think about sometimes quite abstract questions, which they sometimes wonder, why are you asking me this question? Because it doesn't have direct relevance to the subject that I'm currently studying. But you ask them an abstract question, ask them to go away, do some research and bring it back, and then you discuss it in class, and, and it's amazing that I mean, if you, if you have 12, 12 people in, in the class, provided everyone has taken the task seriously, which, which we hope they do, uh, but you have 12 people in the class, often you'll get 12 different answers. And the art of learning is to actually appreciate and understand how your classmate came up with a different answer to the same question, wherein you both had the same set of resources, which was the World Wide Web. Yeah. 
How do you go about uh, ensuring that your students are prepared, and not only from a technical perspective, but in terms of those soft skills over time? Rachel, the soft skills, yeah, critically important. And my view is that soft skills are probably going to be of even more importance as we move forward, uh, in, in part because the, the technical aspects of most jobs, and certainly jobs into the future, uh, are going to be increasingly taken by the field of robotics mm -hmm. um, or um, AI. So, so the tasks and the, the basic uh, technical requirements which exist today are going to be done by not a person. It'll be done by something into the future. But people still need to interact and people still need to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, be it a commercial business, be it government, uh, be it a non-profit, be it a charity, uh, be it a community. Whenever you bring people together and they interact, they have to make a decision. And the decisions are always more complex when the considerations which the individual faces in their own personal circumstances are different from those considerations of the aggregate of the i.e. the community. So, so when we inevitably have decisions which involve some, some trade-off and some conflict between an individual and their community, it becomes fraught with the tensions of human interactions in that regard. And, and that's been the way ever since day dot, yeah. since Adam and Eve in that regard, and, and that has not changed. So, so we focus quite a bit on the ability, the ability to uh, articulate what the problem is, which you either individually or collectively are trying to solve. So getting people to actually cut through some of the emotion, to cut through what they may perceive to be the current issue, because often when, when an issue gets to the point of decision making, there will be a whole raft of context as to why that issue sits on your table. Yes. And understanding the context, but more importantly, understanding where all of the stakeholders come from within that context is critically important. So, so we talk a lot about um, the concept of role playing put yourself in someone's shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk a lot about mediation. We talk a lot about influence and persuasion. Mm -hmm. And so what are those sorts of skills that allow you to enunciate your argument in such a way that people change their minds? That's probably one of the most powerful skills or attributes that anyone could possess in that regard. Yeah. And, um, and, and do so obviously in a respectful uh, manner. So when you look at all of that, that, that involves being able to synthesise quite a large volume of information, mm. to sift through information which is relevant versus irrelevant, and to sift through the information which is factually and evidence-based versus hearsay in that regard. So uh, you know, a lot of those skills, I think nowadays, unfortunately, are, are not well taught. Mm. And so we see in society issues very quickly bubbling up, which become very emotive issues. And it becomes almost, and I think we don't have to look too much further than some of the, some of the global politics we see, it's almost who can shout and bully the loudest. Yeah. And that's never going to lead to a sustainable solution. So, so those, th those skills around, as I say, the ability to synthesise um, the key arguments, articulate what the question is or what the problem you're trying to solve, and then come up with an evidence-based and analytical framework. And it won't work in every case. No. Um, yeah, we, we are unlikely to, to ever fully convince everyone as to the creation of the universe. And um, so, uh, let me not be too flippant there, but there are many issues which are simply just going to be 
uh, issues that reflect deeply held personal views or values and you just got to accept sometimes that you move on. But, but in the business context, if we, if we take the, the finance industry um, and through your own background, Rachel, when, when you have a particularly volatile event, mm -hmm. either at an individual stock level yeah. or at a market level, yes. you know, how many different views do you then get in the next one, two hours, 24 hours about what to do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Many. Yeah. <laughs> and balance and negotiation and whether or not that's internal or with those external stakeholders is imperative. Yeah. I mean, sure. I mean we, go, we go back to you know, the, the, the late 1800s and the, the, great, um, the great bull run on the railway, railroad stocks in the US yes. and their great crash. Yes. The 1929, 30s Wall Street crash. Um, what was it, October 1987, mm -hmm. you know, and year 2000, Y2K, yep. dot com, boom or bust. And Asian. every time we have one of these, one of these major events, we have a lot of views out there, and people have to make decisions, usually in a relatively quick period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it might be easy to say, well, hey. Yeah, you know, the algorithms will take care of all of that because the robots are doing all the trading. But in the finance industry and in asset management, you need to always recognise that you actually you're actually dealing with a person's yes. wealth and livelihood. How do you think we can have sort of a more consistent approach, um, and just make it part of the? The Australian way of being, as a, as opposed to and essentially being a, a political football. There, there are some extraordinarily highly talented, resourceful, uh, dedicated, and certainly hardworking uh, public servants. Yes, and, and I, I actually believe that the quality of the people that we have in the public service in Australia is is very high. Th those individuals and their teams, I often feel sorry for because I think that they themselves have a very strong sense of how policy could be developed and um, developed well and implemented well. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that our political system always allows their voices to be heard mm. in that regard. And not only do we have potentially uh, the government changing every few years, yeah. uh, but of course we have the portfolios within government changing yes. every few years, <laughs> and portfolios change within within a single term of government. Yeah, that's very true. And um, while I I'm reluctant to link the role of minister to the role of um, either chair of the board or CEO. But the reality is that a hands-on minister can be very hands-on in our system. And while I believe that the um, that that all ministers go into their roles with a very genuine intent to do the right thing, you know, think think about some of our large corporates. You know, how would we respond if, for instance, the chair or CEO changed every year, year and a half? You know, what, what would we say about, what would the analysts say about the stability of leadership, about um, continuity of strategy? Yeah, inconsistency. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, retention of, the retention of corporate knowledge and so on. Yeah. And, and, and we also need to appreciate, and, and this, is a, this is not unique to Australia, but ministers don't always come with the technical and experiential background in which the, in which the industries over which their portfolio um, has influence. So how well do you think in Australia then government is working with industry and with education in order to change that, to improve it? We, uh, industry has a critical role to play and um, just like universities have a critical role to play in the innovation ecosystem, so does industry itself. I mean in, industry in terms of whether it partners with um, a spin-off 
whether or not it's involved in the early stages of seeding an idea, um, and in terms of the obviously the the finance and banking industry, mm. they they have to be involved at some point. How industry plays that in terms of the the trade offs or almost so the tensions they have to make between looking after their own interests, which can sometimes be in a highly competitive industry, mm -hmm. versus playing a role which is for the betterment of the the whole of the economy, if you, if you like, is where I think government then has to come in and um, provide a guiding hand mm -hmm. over the top. Not all, not all the, the best ideas sit with government, uh, but not all the best ideas sit with industry and and certainly not all the best ideas at the universities. So it's a, it's a tripartite system, and if you get it right, it can be extraordinarily powerful. But if any, if any of those three links breaks, the whole system essentially breaks. Mm. You know, and I think our greatest challenge here in Australia is that we haven't had the three levers all working at once. We've had ex examples in our history. We've had very strong partnerships between education and industry. We've had very strong partnerships between education and government, very strong partnerships between government and industry. But not three together. I, 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 I cannot recall a period, or certainly not a sustained period in our history, where we've had all three uh, marching to you know, the sound of the same drum, mixing my metaphors. Do you think that will change with the next generation? I'm just thinking about you know, how much we're learning from, from younger people, particularly in terms they've grown up with you know, technology in the palm of their hand, as, as you said. A, a, an attribute or a, a way of thinking which is different from uh, my generation is that the, the, the younger generation I have a very strong belief that I think that everything's possible. And... As you, as you become older, you realise the difficulties because you've been through it. Yeah. Uh, you realise some of the difficulties and challenges. And so you become, I think you become quicker to judge what is possible and what's not possible in your own mind. Yes. So you, you, one, of, one of the challenges that I have, and I love working in a university, is that you are continually thrown up all sorts of questions, issues, challenges um, by students and different ways of looking at the world. And I have to resist the temptation to sort of go, oh, no, I don't think that'll work because X, X and X, right? So don't look for reasons to say no. Right? Look for reasons to say yes. And I, I think that's one thing that's just generally with the differences in generations, and I don't think this is any different between today's um, society and the way it's structured from the last 30 years through the last 50 years through the last 100 years. I think there's always been that divide because with age comes experience, with experience comes this sort of general wearing down a bit, I think, of your willingness because in, the, in a Rumsfeldian world, world, you sort of, you know some of the unknowns. Yes. <laughs> Lovely having a chat with you, Rachel. Lovely. Thanks, Tim.